All right, look at this question here. Sine inverse minus root 3 by 2 is given to us. We need to find its principal value. Okay, let's go. So, we have sine inverse minus root 3 by 2 as it is. We will take the principal value to be some variable y here. So, that means y is equal to sine inverse minus root 3 by 2. Now, we are talking about the principal value here or rather sine inverse minus root 3 by 2 will be between. Okay, so this y will be between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2. This is where the principal values lie. Okay, so y equal to sine inverse minus root 3 by 2 is what we have here. I'll take sine on both sides. Sine of y equal to sine of sine inverse minus root 3 by 2, which comes out to minus root 3 by 2. So we have sine y equal to minus root 3 by 2 here. Okay, we needed to find the principal value of y here. So this should be written as sine of some angle, okay, which is between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2. And that angle will be our answer. Okay, that will be the principal value. So how do we bring that here? So we know that y is between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2. Here sine y is negative. So we are looking in the fourth quadrant between minus pi by 2. Okay, so theta will be between minus pi by 2 and 0. Okay, since it's not equal to 1 or 0, I can say this with certainty. Theta is between minus pi by 2 and 0. So what are we talking about here? Sine theta. Okay, so minus root 3 by 2, I'll write that as minus sine pi by 3, sine 60 degrees is root 3 by 2. So this can be further written as sine of minus pi by 3. Okay, and there we have it. Alright, so sine of y is equal to sine of minus pi by 3. So from this, I can simply say that y will be equal to minus pi by 3 here. Got what we did? We have sine inverse minus root 3 by 2. We took that as some value y. And we know that this should be between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2. Okay, so minus root 3 by 2. I wrote that as sine y where y is between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2, the correct angle corresponding would be minus pi by 3 here. So that's it. This is how you'll solve this question in an exam hall. No need to write all these steps. Okay, let's mark the correct answer as option B here. Got that? Okay, look at this question. We are asked to find the exhaustive domain of this given function, cot inverse x by root of x square minus gif of x square. Gif means greatest integer function. Okay, let's start here. So, since we're looking for the domain, let's first start with the denominator inside cot inverse. Okay, so that is root of something. Now, since that root of something is there, that's something, whatever is inside the root here, x square minus gif of x square must be positive, cannot be even equal to 0 because if it's equal to 0, the denominator becomes equal to 0, there's a problem there, okay. So x square minus gif of x square should be greater than 0 for f of x to be defined. So we'll be starting from this point. Now x square, all right, it can either be an integer or it might not be an integer. This is how we break down the different cases of this. Okay, so if x square is an integer, okay, is if x square is some integer, then what happens? x square and its greatest integer function value, its greatest integral value will both be the same. In other words, x square minus g of x square will be equal to 0. And for this to be defined, we needed it to be greater than 0. Okay, so what does that mean here? So since this is equal to 0, x square cannot be an integer. Okay, x square cannot be an integer. Alright, now, so what are the permissible values of x square? Anything that is not an integer. But 
we'll have to validate that, right? So if x square is not an integer, then, by the way, can x square be a negative integer? No, it can't, okay? So that's why I'll write x square as a whole number because x square is non-negative. It is greater than or equal to zero. I can say for sure that x square cannot be a negative integer. So it's either a whole number or any positive, any other positive value, okay? So when x square is not a whole number and positive at the same time, okay? When x square is not a is not a whole number, then I can say that x square minus gif of x square is certainly greater than zero. Why is that the case? So gif is the greatest integer less than or equal to that value. So gif of x square is the greatest integer less than or equal to x square. We know that x square is not an integer. So for sure, x square minus gif of x square will be greater than zero. Okay. Now from this, we can conclude that x square is no whole number, is not a whole number. You can take any other value, but whole numbers. Okay. Any other positive value, except for whole numbers here. So I can say that x square equal to n, where n is a whole number, are the cases I will remove from all the possible values. So in other words, I can write this as x equal to plus or minus root n, where n is any whole number. These are the cases I should remove from the set of all real values. Okay. So to find the domain, what do we do? We'll write it as x equal to set of all real values, except for the cases where x is equal to plus or minus root n, given that n is a whole number. Let's mark our final answer now. We get it as option D here. Now, what did we do in this question? We looked at this denominator here. We made sure this was greater than zero. And that happens when x square is not an integer. So x square not equal to n, where n is a whole number. Okay. So from this, we figured that x square or x is not equal to plus or minus root n. I took square root on both the sides. And then n is still any whole number. So from this, I deduce that x is r minus the set of all x, such that x equal to plus or minus root n, where n is a whole number. So this is how I arrive at option D as the final answer. Got that? Okay, look at our question here. We are simply looking for the range of this given function the range. All right, let's start. So f of x equal to natural log of sine inverse x square plus x is the function given to us. Okay, we'll start at a very granular level. Let's look at x square plus x now. Okay, x square plus x clearly is a quadratic. The coefficient of x square is positive, so it is an upward facing quadratic. Now, it'll have a minimum value and the maximum value should be infinite. Okay. Now the minimum value, how do you find the minimum value? So the minimum value of this quadratic is given by minus d by 4a. Now minus d by 4a comes out to minus of b square, which is 1 minus 4ac. So you can see that c, there's no constant term here. c is 0. So we'll, the numerator will be just minus 1. And the denominator will be 4 into 1, which is 4 itself. Okay, so I have x square plus x, or rather, we'll write it here. x square plus x is between minus 1 by 4 and infinity. Okay, so this much is what we have right now. x square plus x is between minus 1 by 4 and infinity. But this same x square plus x is inputted is, is acting as an input to sine inverse function here. Okay. So sine inverse, okay, can take inputs between minus one and one. Okay. So sine inverse y, whatever y is, it has to be between minus pi by two and plus pi by two. But the accepted values of y here would be between minus one and one. Okay. 
So this means the accepted value we are talking about is nothing but x square plus x. Okay, so we have x square plus x between minus 1 by 4 and infinity and x square plus x between minus 1 and 1. Both must be satisfied at the same time. Okay, so it's 1 and 2 at the same time. So together tells me that x square plus x is between minus 1 by 4 and 1. Okay, when I combine both these bits of information, I can say that x square plus x is between minus 1 by 4 and 1. Okay, so now I'll write it as sine inverse x square plus x will be between sine inverse 1 and sine inverse minus 1 by 4. Okay, so we have this much with us. Okay, we already know sine inverse 1, that is pi by 2. Okay, sine inverse 1 is pi by 2. This is where it came from. Now, sine inverse minus 1 by 4, we don't know. But we certainly know that this sine inverse of minus 1 by 4 will be negative. Remember, sine inverse of anything is between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2 here. Okay, so sine inverse of minus 1 by 4 is in the fourth quadrant. It's in minus pi by 2 to 0. Okay, so we can say that this is certainly lesser than 0. Why am I stressing on this part? Because all of this sine inverse x square plus x, look at our question, sine inverse x square plus x is fed into this natural log function as its input. Sine inverse x square plus x, I hope you can see it, is fed to ln x as its input. Now, ln, natural log function, can take only positive inputs. So that is why I was stressing on this part here, sine inverse minus 1 by 4. Now, so that means that this input here, sine inverse x square plus x, must be greater than 0. Okay, so this condition came because it is it is being fed to this logarithmic function as its input. Okay, so sine inverse x square plus x is greater than 0. So, I can rewrite whatever I have here as sine inverse x square plus x to be between pi by 2 and to be lesser than or equal to pi by 2 and definitely greater than 0. Okay, sine inverse minus 1 by 4, we already know, is lesser than 0. Okay, so that's why I say that sine inverse x square plus x has to be positive as well. Now, this, these are valid values that are fed into the logarithmic function. Okay, so here, let's apply ln for each of these parts. Ln of sine inverse x square plus x, which is the question itself, is lesser than ln of pi by 2 and greater than ln of 0 is not defined. Okay, so the closest value to 0, if you put that value as an input to the ln function, you will get a huge negative value. Okay, so here we can simply conclude that ln of sine inverse x square plus x is between minus infinity and ln pi by 2. So my final answer will be minus infinity, that's never included, and ln pi by 2, which will certainly be included. Okay, so this will be the range of f of x that we were looking for. Let's mark our final answer now as option D here. Got that? Okay, in our question, we have cos inverse a plus cos inverse b plus cos inverse c to be equal to 3 pi. And f is a function such that f of 1 is given as 2 and this property is always followed. f of x plus y equal to f of x into f of y here. We need to find the value of this given expression. Let's start. So here, we have cos inverse a plus cos inverse b plus cos inverse c equal to 3 pi. And this is very interesting because we already know that cos inverse of anything is between 0 and pi. Okay, so the sum of three co different cos inverses is coming up to 3 pi. 
Now, let each cos inverse be at its maximum value. What is the maximum value of any cos inverse? Like cos inverse A or cos inverse B or cos inverse C. That's pi. Okay. So basically, we are adding pi thrice to get the sum as 3 pi. Okay. So here, there is only one possibility where this sum of 3 cos inverse, like 3 of these cos inverses add up to 3 pi. There is only one possibility and that is when cos inverse A, cos inverse B and cos inverse C are at its maximum value of pi here. What is pi? We can write that as cos inverse minus 1. Okay, because cos, cos pi is minus 1. That's the idea here. So, here I can say that A and B and C are all equal to minus 1 here. Okay, so A, B, C are all equal to minus 1. And now, let's apply this property. Okay, f of x plus y equal to f of x into f of y here. So, in that fancy expression that we were supposed to find, we had A, we had B, we had C. We also had f of 1 f of 2 and f of 3. So, it would be convenient if we had these values directly with us, right? So, let's apply this condition to find f of 2 and f of 3. f of 1 is already given. Okay. So, how do we find f of 2? We have to use this condition here. So, simply to find f of 2, put x and y both equal to 1. That's it. So, then we get it as f of 1 plus 1, which is f of 2, equal to f of x into f of y. Okay, f of x plus y equal to f of x into f of y. Then becomes f of 1 into f of 1, which is 2 into 2, 4. Okay, so we got f of 2 as 4. Now, how do we find f of 3? Simple. Okay, just put x equal to 2 and y equal to 1 or vice versa. Doesn't matter. So here we'll get f of 2 plus 1 equal to f of 2 into f of 1 here. f of 2 plus 1 is f of 3. And this is equal to f of 2, which is 4, into f of 1, which was 2. This comes out to 8 here. So we got f of 1 equal to 2 already there in the question. f of 2 is 4 and f of 3 is 8. Okay, and we already obtained a equal to b equal to c equal to minus 1. So, we had this much information now. Okay, so with this, we'll have to find the value of this fancy expression. Directly put these values. What do we get? A is minus 1 raised to 2 into f1, which is 2, plus b, which is minus 1 raised to 2 into f2, which is 4, plus c, which is minus 1 into 2 into f3, which is 8, plus a plus b plus c, which is minus 1 plus minus 1 plus minus 1 here. Three different minus 1s are added up. And denominator, we get this same thing here. So, minus 1 raised to 2 into 2 is minus 1 power 4, minus 1 power 8, and minus 1 power 16. So, these are the same three values that come in the denominator. Minus 1 power 4 plus minus 1 power 8 plus minus 1 power 16. Let's quickly finish this off. This is nothing but 1 plus 1 plus 1. Then there are 3 minus 1s on the numerator and 1 plus 1 plus 1. So all of this adds up to 3 here. And they also add up to 3 in the denominator. So together, the answer becomes 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2. So the value of this entire expression is simply equal to 2 here. Okay. So what did we do here? The key to this question was realizing that cos inverse x can take a maximum value of pi. The second you do that, all these values, cos inverse a, cos inverse b, cos inverse c become pi. And then because of that, a, b and c become minus 1. Okay. So with that, we find a, b and c. And then we have f of 1 here. Put different values of x and y to obtain f of 2 and f of 3 as shown in this question. Once we have all the values, we are sorted, we put the values directly and obtain the answer as C, which is 2. Got that?
In this question, we have f of x given to us. We have one big function here, f of x. Now, it's given that the range is p comma q, both included. We have to find the value of p plus q. Let's go. So this is the fancy big function that we have. Sine inverse x plus 2 tan inverse x plus this quadratic x square plus 4x plus 1. Okay, for this quadratic, I'll try to complete this square. So I have to write this plus 1 as plus 4 minus 3. So what happens? x square plus 4x plus 4 becomes a perfect square. And this minus 3 remains outside. Okay, so that is how we complete the square here. x square plus 4x plus 4 is a complete square. And then there's a minus 3. So together, this becomes sine inverse x plus 2 tan inverse x plus x plus 2 the whole square minus 3. Okay. So once we have the function in this form, we realize that, okay, the range is p comma q. We have to find the value of p plus q. So let's look for the domain here. Okay. So look at this quadratic. x square plus 2x, x plus 2 the whole square minus 3. Okay. So this part, you can put any real value of x. Okay, you can put any real value of x, that's fine. So what about this one, 2 tan inverse x. So x can take again any real value. All right, fine, looks like the domain is going to be any real value, but we'll have to stop at sine inverse x. Okay, because x here is between minus 1 and 1. For sine inverse x to exist, x should be must be between minus 1 and 1 here. Okay. So, now since x has to adjust between minus 1 and 1 for sine inverse x, the same thing will apply for every other place. Okay. Though x can be any real value for 2 tan inverse x and x plus 2 the whole square minus 3 separately, x between minus 1 and 1 will be the domain for this entire function together. Okay. So, here we have x between minus 1 and 1. Okay, now let's look at f of minus 1. Let's look at f of 1 here. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it this way? So when we look at f of minus 1, I can write that as sine inverse minus 1. And what is sine inverse minus 1? That is minus pi by 2. Okay, so sine inverse minus 1 is minus pi by 2 plus 2 tan inverse minus 1. What's tan inverse minus 1? Again, tan inverse of, that is minus tan inverse 1, or tan inverse minus 1 is tan, is pi by 4. Okay, so rather minus pi by 4. So we have minus pi by 2 here for sine inverse x, and 2 tan inverse x becomes 2 into minus pi by 4, which is minus pi by 2. Plus, what do we have here? minus 1 plus 2 the whole square minus 3. minus 1 plus 2 the whole square becomes 1 square. 1 square minus 3. So 1 square minus 3, okay, I'll leave it as it is. It's 1 square minus 3. So these three functions, okay, you can see it here, taking these values. Now, if we look at f of 1, what happens? Sine inverse 1, okay, sine inverse 1 sine pi by 2 is 1. So there we go. Pi by 2 here for the first part. Then 2 into tan inverse 1. Tan pi by 4 is 1. So there we go. Tan inverse 1 becomes pi by 4. So this together is nothing but 2 into pi by 4, pi by 2 here. Plus x plus 2 the whole square minus 3. x plus 2 becomes 1 plus 2 the whole square, which is 9. And then this minus 3 comes out here. Okay, so we have this much with us. Let's look at each part individually. Okay, so we are looking for the range of f of x. Okay, so the range of f of x is what we're looking for. We already found that the domain is minus 1 comma 1. These are the values I can put here. Now, I'm assuming minus 1 is where the minimum value of this function happens and 1 is where the maximum value of this function happens. How do we cross-check? Look at each part separately. We are adding three parts up here, basically. 
Okay, so sine inverse x is between minus pi by 2 and plus pi by 2. You can see the minimum value happens here. Okay, for sine inverse x, the minimum value happens at minus pi by 2 and the maximum value happens at plus pi by 2. So that is there in f of 1 and minus pi by 2 is there in my f of minus 1. Okay, let's look at the next part here. 2 into tan inverse x. Again, tan inverse x is between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2, both not included. But when you put, when you restrict what all values x can take, so x is between minus 1 and 1. So here, if x is between minus 1 and 1, then tan inverse x will be between tan inverse minus 1, which is minus pi by 4, and tan inverse 1, which is pi by 4. Okay. So tan inverse x is between minus pi by 4 and pi by 4. You can see f of minus 1 will have tan inverse x is minimum value and f of 1 will have tan inverse x is maximum value. Let's check for this quadratic here. Put the values minus 1 comma 1 here. So then when you put minus 1 here, this becomes 1 minus 3. And when you put plus 1 here, it becomes 9 minus 3. Clearly, this is the minimum. This is the maximum for any value between minus 1 and 1 here. Okay. So, now, can you tell me the range of f of x? So, we can say that f of 1 is the maximum value and f of minus 1 will be the minimum value. Okay. So, that is how we conclude that this will be the range of x. Okay. Range of f of x. So, f of minus 1 is minus pi by 2 minus pi by 2 which is minus pi plus 1 minus 3, which is minus 2. Okay, comma, f of 1, which is pi by 2 plus pi by 2, which is pi plus 9 minus 3, which is 6. What are we looking for, guys? We are not looking for the range here. We are looking for the value of p plus q. So you take minus pi by 2 and add it to, sorry, minus pi minus 2, and you add it to pi plus 6. So this together, comes out to 4. Okay, so the value of p plus q that we are looking for is equal to 4. Let's mark our final answer as option C here. What did we do in this question? So, first we found out the domain. The domain was minus 1, comma 1. Okay, with that logic, we put those values into this to see if it's the minimum and the maximum respectively. So at minus 1, sine inverse x, tan inverse x, and this quadratic will take its minimum value. At plus 1, sine inverse x, tan inverse x, and the quadratic will take its maximum value. So that's where we conclude that f of minus 1 and f of 1 will be the range of f of x. Okay, so with that logic, we found the values of p and q, and we get p plus q equal to 4. Got that?